Thank you for your time here tonight. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you uh, as being a father, and I wanted to... Thank you. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, how has your life been different, and have you, have you faced any challenges? Wow. Um, well, look, here's the best way I can explain it. Uh, you know kind of like the Old Testament and the New Testament? Um, it's that big of a deal. It's like everything changes. And for other parents out there... Um, you know, someone said something to me. They said, you know, you finally share a title with God. I said, what's that? You're both fathers. I said, that's really, it's very deep. You think about that. Um, and it's true. Uh, yeah, it's, it still is changing me. It's not like a thing that gets changed immediately. Um, but I'll be honest, part of it, boy, does it animate me to want to fight harder because, you know, the, I, I really, look, I, I'm going to, I'm going to generalize this. There's plenty of good people without children and there's plenty of bad people without children, okay? So that's fine. But I generally believe that if more people in our leadership class in America had children earlier, America would be a much freer country. I really believe that. Um, I, th I, could, I could go into this in great detail, but um, it anchors you. It's very real. You know, we live in kind of this very disturbing moment where kind of fictional narratives reign over kind of reality, Having a child is very real. You, you, don't, you don't get to like live in this kind of postmodern argument of, well, you know, I define my own existence and my own gender. It's like, no, actually, it's very, very real. And it rejects all this kind of nonsensical abstractions, and it anchors you in a way that is very, very profound. So I, uh, I encourage, and I say this with no sarcasm, I encourage young people to get married very early and stay very loyally married to that person and have lots of children to reject hookup culture and all that nonsense that is pervading our society. And so, yeah, I, I could go further. And just, just for men, you know, women email us all the time. They say they can't find husbands and all that. We, we get that all the time. So I'll just give some advice. No, I'll give some advice to men about the two things that they say are missing with young men in America. I know you didn't ask about this, but I don't care. So <laughs> self-control. Is number one, young ladies would probably agree. And then number two, they're not responsible for anything. Responsibility is considered to be the most attractive quality in men because it's so lacking in America today. So if you're looking for a wife or vice versa, I, I'll let my wife give the young ladies advice. I'm not even going to try to go there. But young men, we have a men's summit for this exact reason now at Turning Point USA. So God bless you. Thank you. Hi, Charlie. I just want to say thank you for being here tonight. And then my question is, there have been some pro-abortion posters put up around campus by Planned Parenthood advertising door-knocking jobs. As a student body who is mostly conservative, how does Planned Parenthood get away with this, and how can we educate our peers? Yeah, um, how do they get away with it? Yeah, I mean, guess, yeah, you guys are a Christian school. I, I mean, I would be, so let's pretend I was in charge of this school. I wouldn't allow Planned Parenthood to put up posters at GCU. I just wouldn't allow it. Now... <laughs> Now you say, okay, Charlie, you know, aren't you for freedom of speech and all of that? Yeah, look, you're a Christian school. Is it in alignment with your values? No. And also, I don't think advertising for the butchery of children is necessarily the speech that I'm going to go to the wall for. But if you have that opinion, we could dialogue about it. Life begins at conception. It's very clear. It's not your DNA. It's not your choice. Abortion is kind of in vogue right now. It's kind of something that everyone wants to talk about. I've said for quite a while that the great, let's just say, um, the pro-life community has to continue to step up to the bat to make it easier for people to be able to have children in this country, including through some public policy measures. But I, I just, I, I always cringe, and it really makes me sad when I have to hear the term unwanted pregnancy. I, I just, I, I, that, what a, that, that's a morally troubling statement, isn't it? Unwanted? Unwanted by whom? By the creator? Oh, no, no. Creator already loves that being and wants that being to thrive and survive and flourish and breathe and be able to be out in the world. Unwanted by the mother in that particular moment, maybe, is, and I, I'm not going to get deep into why that might be the matter. It might be a lack of explanation of what that being actually is. But look, we need to better educate about this. I'll be very honest. Um, it's a slaughter in our country. It's a million babies every single year. Um, it happens. There's 3,000 abortions a day in our country. And a vast, vast majority of them are abortions of convenience and choice. They're not because of rape, incest, or even life of the mother, which is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare. But let's pretend we just, you know, said, okay, you can have abortion for those three categories. 
well, then you're talking about 99.2% of all abortions that are part of that 1 million category that are abortions at convenience. So look, this is a question of the morals of a society. Why is abor- abortion uncomfortable for some people to talk about? Well, it's because it, it, do- it, it happens in closed rooms and it doesn't really feel personal because it's private. Well, we know it's happening just because you don't see it every single day. It should still really bother you. And boy, if we as Christians put up with it, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's very, very clear in the scriptures, when life begins. And um, so, yeah, look, I, I could go on about that, but uh, Planned Parenthood has, has done more destruction for these communities than almost any other organization. We should defund Planned Parenthood, by the way. They shouldn't, they shouldn't receive a taxpayer dollar. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's the outfit I was talking about, by the way. Look at that. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I got to say, I didn't know what to really think of you before, beforehand, before this speech. Um, I can say I'm now definitely a fan. Um, thank you. <laughs> my sister got me uh, interested in, uh, in your speeches and in your stuff like that. Uh, she couldn't make it tonight. She's in California right now. Uh, she's serving our country in the Air Force. And uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and she would love for you to sign this hat. But uh, on to my question. Sorry. Just wanted to plug that in there. Um, so I loved what you said about the Founding Fathers tonight. Obviously, that's why I uh, wear this attire. Um, so uh, my question is, if the Founding Fathers could somehow see America in 2022, what is one thing you think they'd be proud of that we've overcome or that we've maintained? And what is one thing you think they'd be disappointed in? It's a very, very profound question, and I'd be happy to sign that. Um, disappointed in um, almost all of it. Uh, so, but... Yeah, look, I think what they would be most surprised, let me start with this. The thing that, and here we are kind of playing Monday morning quarterback of the great designers of the longest lasting constitutional republic and freest society in the history of the world. So, you know, just forbid me from doing this, but I think they would, I think it's very well agreed upon is the creation of this fourth branch of government. Is this unelected administrative state that came up in the Woodrow Wilson presidency of the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Justice, the EPA, this unaccountable, unelected fourth branch of government that has unlimited amounts of power, that kind of operates in total violation to the promises, the moral claims of the U.S. Constitution, the moral claims of consent of the governed. Where do they get their consent from? They just operate on their own. They always exist. The machinery grinds on. Separation of powers? Not really, because they're almost above the three branches of government. The fourth branch of government spies on presidents, spies on members of Congress, right? I mean, it's, it leaks documents of IRS, you know, documents of sitting president. And like, that's, they're almost more powerful. They're almost the sovereign. And then finally, the thing that really troubles me the most about the fourth branch of government is another one of the claims that Madison and Hamilton and Jay made in the Federalist Papers is checks and balances. What is the check right now against this fourth branch of government? It, almost nothing. It's as if now the real power is in the inner workings of these bureaucracies. So I think the founding fathers would just be flabbergasted about how we allowed that to happen and then how we were able to, like, why didn't we do something about that earlier? hundred years or why did, you know, maybe why they didn't put more safeguards in place for there. But yeah, let me, let me say the one thing I think they would be really thrilled about or excited about, I think they would be shocked at how long the Constitution stood. And I'm, not because they didn't value their work, it's just it n- never before has a small r Republican form of government stood so long. They wrote about this in the Federalist Papers, and Thomas Jefferson basically wrote this in so many ways, he's totally misquoted and misunderstood, where people say, oh, yeah, he wanted the revolution every couple of years. No, he didn't want that. What he was saying is it, this form of government has a tendency not to last. The fact we still have the same United States Constitution that we had in 1787 and 1791 at both ratification of the Bill of Rights and the re- usual Constitution is unbelievable. That should make everyone pause and say, why? It's because the Constitution was not written for the times. It was written to stand the test of time. Because it makes very clear arguments on morality and human behavior. This is something that differentiates me from the progressives. John Dewey, who's kind of the father of public education in America, said it's a new age. We have machines and airplanes and we have gas-powered engines Humanity is entering a new era, whereas a conservative say, whoa, 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 just because you have Twitter and you can fly across the country doesn't mean human beings radically improve. We're just as selfish and greedy and broken as we were, regardless of the technology we have. In fact, the technology only amplifies how broken we actually are. 
It only makes evil easier. And so I think, um, without belaboring the point, the founders, I think, would actually be stunned at how much we have screwed up and how much of a chance we still have to revive it. And so I think that should give you a lot of hope. It really does. I by no means think America is past the point of no return. And honestly, a lot of it is thanks to the founders. I mean, they gave us so many opportunities, safeguards. And uh, by the way, the left always wants to get rid of those safeguards. Abolish the Electoral College. Abolish the fact that Nebraska has senators. Abolish the filibuster. Like, whoa. No, that's really a thing, right? They want to combine all the great plain states into one big state because they say it should be done on population. Of course, not understanding that the states created the federal government. The federal government didn't create the states. Big difference. That local is better over the central or the supreme. Okay, so, but I just want to just reinforce, I, I mean, I, I love your um, fascination with the American founders. I, I, I wish, that I, I pray for a revival in our nation where people really appreciate how special they were. 55 out of 56 of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Bible-believing, church-attending Christians. John, Ad, John Adams spoke fluent Hebrew. This is how you know how based the founding fathers were, okay? They put Leviticus on the Liberty Bell, Okay. Leviticus, not the book of John, not Psalms, Leviticus, okay? Let liberty reign throughout the land of which you are in. So I think a constitutional reset is sorely needed in our country. God bless you, man. Thank you. All right. Hey, Charlie. Uh, I asked the same question back like two years ago in Bismarck, North Dakota, and I think my aunt would kind of kill me if I didn't say hi for uh, Amber Vibeto. And uh, it was... I'm trying to remember the last time I was in Bismarck, but okay. <laughs> Not a lot of people go there. You know what? I, I do remember. Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, it's how will abortion affect our youth, or not our youth, but my generation? And now that we kind of have all this stuff going on in the Supreme Court with Roe v. Wade, how would you answer that question now as to where, like, two years ago? Yeah, well, praise God, first and foremost, that Roe v. Wade was overturned. It was an awful judicial decision. Awful. And, um, and, And if a liberal, not a leftist, is being honest, they would even agree it was awful judicial interpretation. It was a total drive-by shooting of the U.S. Constitution. It was. And it was allowed to stay for far too long. And actually, if, if, the, if the left was being honest, of which they're not about this topic, the decision that was administered down was actually agnostic on the issue of abortion itself. The court did not rule on whether abortion was right or wrong. It simply said it should be left to the states. Now, I wish they would have ruled on it being right or wrong, obviously, because it's very clear, but that's, that's besides the point. Okay, so how does abortion impact your, your, your generation? Well, it already is. I mean, you know, imagine if you had a million more people in your genera- you know, the younger generation every single year. Maybe we wouldn't need this relaxed immigration policies and all these other things. Um, you know, I, 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 you look at certain communities, especially, you know, the black community in this country, the black birth rate has been going down significantly the last 40 years, where in certain communities the abortion rate is actually greater than the birth rate in certain communities. So it definitely impacts that. But let me kind of talk more morally, if you will. By the way, the U.S. birth rate has fallen 20% by 2007. 2007. Uh, It's remarkable. Let me just talk more morally, though. If a country or a nation, a civilization or a people, put up with a million souls basically being terminated every single year, then what else are we going to put up with? The answer is quite a lot. And and I'm not, you shouldn't be shocked, the very same nation that puts up with that puts up with the medical mutilation of children at uh, alleged children's hospitals. It's, just our, it's a very simple moral question, which again, which is why I encourage Christians to speak out about this. What do you do when you're strong? Do you use that strength to protect the weak, or do you try to get more strength yourself and exploit people that aren't as strong as you? It's a very simple moral question. And biblical Christianity tells us to protect those that can't protect themselves. But if you don't believe in that thing, you don't believe in an absolute standard or objective in that way, why not use your strength to crush the weak? Most countries do that, by the way. Most countries have done that. It's all about power, right? And by the way, if you don't believe that every being is an image bearer, then it's even easier to justify that. As Joseph Stalin would say, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And he was good at racking up statistics. Anywhere between 40 to 50 million people intentionally murdered 
under his regime, Mao Zedong, anywhere between 30 to 40 million people. And by the way, both Stalin and Mao were known for, Mao more than Stalin, were, more, were known for their zealous anti-religiosity. I mean, th- th- you cannot have a widespread Marxist regime and a vibrant church that is preaching the word of God. They cannot exist. So one has to go or the other. You have to take over the church. You have to dilute the preaching. One has to happen or the other. And so that's exactly why, I mean, Mao all but basically outlawed religious expression. It wasn't Christianity. It was just basically Taoist Confucian teaching that he utilized for his own purpose and also basically absorbed it. So how does it impact our country? It impacts our country in every way possible. Um, but, look, I, it's just a matter of what is right and what is, what, is, what is real and what is true. And I know for me personally... I'm going to do everything I possibly can to protect those that can't protect themselves. Thank you. Hello, Charlie. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts on a complete immigration moratorium? Yeah, I mean, right now I think it's a great idea, especially with where unemployment is right now. Um, look, I think immigration should always be modified, and let's just say, not modified, immigration policy should be adjusted towards the current circumstances that we're living through, right? So here's my, here's my main argument, that U.S. governmental policy should always serve the citizen first. Always serve the citizen. All of you right now are entering into a job market. You're entering into a set of circumstances uh, where you are probably going to have student loan debt, where you probably – inflation is absolutely crushing younger people right now. I believe there is a moral social contract argument to make that American college graduates should be given preferences and hirings over foreign students. And that is a moral question, right? So then people say, well, Charlie, how is that fair? Of course it's fair. It's fair in the question of whose government is it? The government of the American people should first and foremost serve the American people. Once you're able to have excesses beyond your limitations, then we could talk about how generous we want to be. But we right now are a nation $31 trillion in debt, with the most depressed, suicidal, alcohol-addicted, psychiatric drug-addicted generation in history. That generation needs a lot of help right now, you guys. And I don't mean that in a negative way or a condescending way. And so immigration policy should be adjusted in that way. Not to mention, we had 5 million people legally enter into our country this last year. Let's press the pause. Let's allow that assimilation to happen, if at all, because it certainly isn't happening quick enough. So I fully support it. Um, I think in the future that could be adjusted or changed. But, you, but this is what prudence is all about, which is what makes a conservative different than an ideological person. You look around, you see what's happening, and you adjust policy based on the time, the circumstances, and your desired goal and objective. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi there, Charlie. Nice to meet you. Uh, preface, I grew up, uh, never really had religion in my life, um, but somehow was I always remained conservative real question being in this environment trying to get into politics being very open-minded and actually enjoying learning and and growing with my knowledge of of the bible and christianity as an outsider i feel like in conservatism and i want to get into politics how am i supposed to meld the two but while not truly being a believer well first of all thank you for being here it's awesome um and yeah of course there's a place for people that aren't believers in the conservative movement Of course there is. It's about building a coalition for liberty and things that we agree on. And I will always say, though, that having biblical Christianity and objective standard is of which the entire, there we go again, the entire foundation that the movement is built upon, um, I I would venture a guess that if you really get into the weeds of our movement over a period of time, I think you will become a believer if you remain open minded. Um, especially if you read the word and you pray and you ask God to come into your life because um, reading of the word never turns up void ever. So, but look, I I get this question a lot. I want to be very, very clear that as long as you believe in liberty, you believe in what I talked about here, and you believe in the natural law, which I would probably guess that you probably believe in the natural law. I believe the natural law was written by somebody, right? Some people, just not trying to suppose, but someone with a secular view would say the natural law was just kind of, you know, it just sprung into, or we don't know. Let's just put it, let's, I think that's fair. Then welcome aboard, right? Because we're here as a way to build a civil government and a free society. We, we believe that those origins and those roots unquestionably come from biblical Christianity. But if you want to lock arms with me to make sure that we no longer have a million abortions every single year, or you want to lock arms with me to make sure that kids are not medically mutilated for profit, 
then I'll be more willing to march in the streets with you alongside most past, more so than most pastors in this country because most pastors are totally silent on those issues. And so I, I'm not here to say that you have your metaphysics perfectly configured, right? I wouldn't say that. I believe there's only one way, one truth, and one, you know, obviously path. But I will say, though, that I'm a behaviorist when it comes to some of these things. What do you do? And I know some atheists that don't believe a thing of the Christian worldview that I have. But they are more outspoken about doing good and confronting evil than a lot of Christians that I know. And I say, welcome aboard. I truly do. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my question is coming from a perspective of a Christian that's very, very pro-life and cares very much about justice. A topic I struggle with is the death penalty. How should I, as a pro-lifer and a Christian, view death penalty as someone who also cares about justice? And it's a lot di more difficult for me to defend a murderer, a criminal, versus an unborn innocent child? That's a great question. You and I both struggle with it. I've, I've been outspokenly against the death penalty in years past, but I've got to be honest, I'm moving away from that position. I'm not totally there yet. So let me, let me just kind of correct one thing that you said, which is not, not trying to, you know, kind of focus on it. Executing a criminal is not murder, okay? That's, that's something different, okay? Some would say that's justice. Some would say that's the, you know, administration of um, the, correct, the, the proper consequence of the rule of law. Now, I'm not totally there. Here's one of my big problems with the death penalty. One of the reasons why I'm against it probably, and, but I'm moving on it, is how many people we've wrongfully executed in the last 50 or 60 years. It, it is the great argument against the death penalty. A lot of people were wrongly executed based on, ex on bad evidence, and they were later shown to be exonerated or, you know, basically, there we go again, um, with exculpatory evidence, right? So that's number one. But I, I do want to say something. I think the weakest argument that people that are, uh, by the way, the death penalty is more expensive. There's all these other different things, right? Also the belief that this, the state shouldn't have the power to execute its own citizens. I resonate with that. But I think the weakest argument for the, against the death penalty, the weakest argument is they say, well, I don't want innocent life to be taken, and I don't want to have someone on death row to be murdered. Okay, the innocent person in the womb wasn't like the chainsaw murderer or whatever reason they're up for death row, okay? There's, it's a totally different moral category. The person who's on death row is probably there for a very, very good reason, right? The person in the womb hasn't done anything to anybody whatsoever. It is the definition of innocence, right? They, they've done nothing but just existed in the womb. So, but I want to I be honest. I struggle with it for the reasons of people that were wrongly accused, and then you can't reverse that, Right? Once they're dead, they're dead, and that's wrong. It's more expensive, and I also really, I try to be principled on this idea that the government should not be able to have the power to take the life of its own citizens. I, I, I do resonate with that argument. But at the same time, I see some of the crimes committed by some of these people in our country, and I struggle with that too. And I say, I'm supposed to now pay for meals for them for the rest of their life, really? And so I'm right with you with struggling with it, but I, I definitely yield towards the direction of not having the death penalty currently. But um, I have to say one of the clearest moral thinkers on this is Dennis Prager. He's definitely moved me a little bit. He's been great. Thank you. God bless you. Charlie, thank you for coming out here. I wanted to continue with the foreign policy aspect. Do you believe that NATO has a place in the 21st century and we should still be a part of it? Probably not, no. I, I would have to say that NATO is basically the, the, the largest socialist subsidy experiment in the history of foreign policy. Basically, NATO is us pumping in tens of billions of dollars, so these major countries have to then go defend them. Like, we, they're, not, they're not defending themselves, right? Um, why? So let, let me just get this straight. If Putin launches a missile to Poland right now and hits a restaurant, you might get drafted. How is that in our national interest, exactly? I'm just, I just ask a series of questions. I tend to believe that large, stand, long-standing, you know, massive multinational alliances, not a big fan of that. But um, I'm open to different arguments on that. Um, but, man, you want to talk about – you want to you you have your opinion shaken on NATO? Go look at how they're imposing radical gender theory throughout all the militaries of Europe. They, they fly the, the, the LGBT flag, all that stuff. That, that's what NATO is. You should go check it out. So um, – but at the same time, I do, wanna, I do believe that the West is deserving of protection. But boy, 
uh, large entanglements in some of these nations, and there's a lot of members of NATO that are awfully questionable. Turkey plays both sides of the ball. Let's just put it that way. God bless you. Thank you. Got to get to the next one. Sorry. Thank you. Hello, Charlie. Um, I would like to ask you about the importance of money. So under Executive Order uh, 14067, the Federal Reserve is tasked with looking into how the a central bank digital currency might be created, and they are evaluating the necessary steps and requirements of implement, implementing one. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin, and what do you think, uh, how important do you think its adoption is in securing individual liberties in this country? I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. Um, the technology, I think, is terrific. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time. Now, when I say Bitcoin, I really mean uh, cryptocurrency more broadly or generally. I'm not trying to endorse a coin or telling you to buy it or any of that stuff that got Kim Kardashian in trouble. Okay, for all the federal regulators that are watching this, um, you could buy Ethereum, you could buy whatever you want. Um, but the idea of decentralized currency that is transparent and inflation resistant is very important to liberty. Money is a store of value. That's all that it is. Money replaced the barter system. It's more efficient. It allowed the entire Western world to be developed. And the war on liberty is, direct, is being directly waged by the Federal Reserve for a reason to deteriorate our money, I think, to eventually reset it, um, to be able to crush your earning potential, crush your ability to store capital, crush your ability um, to be able to earn a life, you know, build a life and earn capital quickly and the ability you want to. Bitcoin, I think, is a hedge against all of that. Without going too deep into the technology of all of it, using blockchain and using it more broadly, it is resistant to kind of tyrannical intervention, if you will. Uh, blockchain, because of its unique one-to-one -one ability to be able to exist, um, the, and the other the other part about Bitcoin that's so that's so fascinating is the ledger, the ability that you'd be able to see every transaction in real time. That only gives you trust and transparency in the system, where our current our current system is built on fiat currency wishes and hopes. So I'm a big believer in crypto, big believer in blockchain. Um, I think it's just a matter of time before. You know, that becomes the norm. But let me say one final thing. Resist, 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 resist the federal government creating a digital currency. Do not allow that to happen. God bless you. Thank you. Hi, Charlie. First, I just wanted to do thank you for coming. I'm a big fan. Uh, so I do want to be a dad one day, and I'm a little worried about uh, the public school sy system pushing uh, more and more radical leftist agenda like transgenderism, uh, socialism, CRT. So I, would, I just wanted to uh, see what you would recommend for me and conservative parents for protecting their kids as they enter school. Like would you recommend private schooling or homeschooling? Well, a couple things. So we have the uh, wonderful partnership with Dream City Christian Academy. Um, <laughs> which is a Turning Point Academy right up the street. We're super thrilled about that. So if anyone watching wants to send their kid to a great school, Dream City Christian does a phenomenal job. Uh, we're also launching Turning Point Academy pod schools all across the country uh, for kind of homeschooling centers. For anyone watching or you have friends or family or relatives that want to start a pod school with Turning Point Academy anywhere across the country, we'd be thrilled about that. Um, and look, so the numbers are overwhelming, though, that homeschooling kids outperform even private school and definitely government school. Kids, but look, every parent is different. I went to public school, and for me, it was it was a good thing. It was, despite the indoctrination and the Marxism, I, I was a little different. Where the more opposition that I actually encountered, the stronger it made me, and the more willing it wanted. You know, I wanted the fight, but not every kid is like that, right? Some kids bend to the whims and kind of the whispers of secular progressivism when it's in the schools. But I think generally and broadly, we need a mass exodus of kids from the government school system into private schools and homeschooling, we have to try to double the homeschooling population and double the Christian private school population in the next couple of years. God bless you. Thank you.